this is, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but for me, I, this, is, this, is, this is really wonderful. And I've, it doesn't get any better, somebody said. You know, the, uh, the energy of this partnership, it's, it's, it's very exciting to see that much of it is still here 20 years later. And it's very exciting to have a sense of how much all of you put into this effort um, back when we were doing the NSFNet. I'm not going to take more time this evening. I'm going to ask Doug Gale to make a brief announcement, and then we'll get right on to our speaker. Doug? Many of you knew Irene Lombardo and would hope she could join us for this event. It turns out she could not. She has a torn rotator cuff and is pretty much laid up with that. However, three individuals in the room have a Get Well card. Those of you that know Irene may well want to sign that card. Uh, Steve Goldstein has one, Guy Alms has one, and Don Mitchell. Would you three guys stand up so people know where you are? If you would like to sign a card to Irene, uh, please see one of those folks and uh, sign the card. We have also grabbed onto one of the mugs for her so she gets a mug as well. Thank you. All right, you can put your business cards in there too, along with your signature. Thanks. Um, in, the, in the very best tradition of uh, distributed governance uh, of the internet, I love it. Um, so uh, to introduce our speaker for tonight, I'd like to ask John Connolly to come forward. You, all, you guys all know John. You know he's the first one who did high performance computing at the National Science Foundation. Come on, John. We're all having fun, right? The, uh, right. I, it's been really a, a, a delight of the last couple of days talking to people, trading old war stories, fighting, refighting old battles, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of heroes involved. And uh, um, I met a lot of friends here that uh, I haven't seen for 20 years. And uh, one one of one of the best friends of this program is going to give a speech tonight. Um, I take you back to uh, uh, 1984. And uh, when we were, uh, there was a, the head of the foundation at that time was a fellow named Ed Knapp, uh, who was a physicist from Los Alamos. And the science advisor was Jay Keyworth, who was also a, a, a physicist. And they, they were persuaded by the LAX report that we really needed a, a special program. Uh, and they, they got it into the budget. And then, uh, and then Ed Knapp left and uh, dumped it all in Eric's uh, hands. And, uh, but he, uh, he took over and was uh, one of the best advocates of the program. Uh, the, uh, the course, if you, if you have a new program in Washington, it's sort of treated like a new idea in science. Everybody tries to kill it, right? And so, and Eric was one of the, uh, he took care of the program, he got it through the hurdles, and he, uh, we owe him a lot of credit uh, I remember when he took over the foundation, some of us in the computing business said, yes, we've got, we've got a computer expert. Uh, this was the guy who was the manager for the stretch project. Anybody remember the stretch? Yeah, see, okay. Uh, when I was, I was just a, a child at the time, I was a, uh, <laughs> uh, I remember when I was a student, we all lusted after the stretch. We really wanted to use that machine and uh, of course, IBM said they lost money on it, and uh, maybe Eric can correct me. But then it, it, a lot of the stuff moved over to the 360, which was really a very good machine, and I, I love that machine. Uh, and uh, so, uh, the, um, so Eric was a really great director of the foundation. He had this, he had this vision, and he would say things, sometimes not in public, but he really wanted to change the structure of American science. And uh, he built centers, uh, science and technology centers, engineering research centers, and really did change the structure. Uh, not to everybody's happiness, you know, people hate change, but, but uh, Eric stuck through, 
And uh, he, uh, he continues, he left NSF in 1990, uh, but he continues to be a main force in, in science and technology in Washington. He uh, has uh, the Washington Advisory Group. Uh, he's a fellow of the Council on Competitiveness. Uh, he's, uh, he's very, he does a lot of stuff. So I'm very happy and honored to, uh, to uh, introduce my friend, uh, Mr. Eric Block. Thanks a lot, John, for your introduction. It's, uh, as you get older, the introductions seem to get longer. <laughs> and by the way, my remarks are getting shorter. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure you're glad to hear about this. Uh, but I'm very honored to speak here tonight to a group that has done so much to make NSFNet a reality. And I want to thank especially Doug Van Howling and Eric Opperly for the invitation to speak at the celebration of 20 or so years since the NSF uh, net uh, creation. NSF net was certainly a development that was not only timely, but important with far reaching impact beyond what anybody could expect it uh, to have. And I want to spend a few minutes on the environment uh, of the 1980s or mid-80s and the opportunities that existed for NSF to address its mission and at the same time become a force in computational and communications research. I also want to make some comments reflecting on the issues that we are facing today in science, technology, and in competitiveness. All this, and I, so I, and I promise not to interfere too much with your dinner and other festivities, um, I think two hours will do. <laughs> when I became director of NSF in 1984, a number of things were very clear. First, if NSF wanted to be true to its mission, and let me quote from its mission statement, to initiate and support basic scientific research and research fundamental to the engineering process. It no longer could be primarily concerned with disciplinary research and principal investigators only. Its mindset had to change and it needed to be open to multidisciplinary research, to organizational approaches that allowed groups from various departments in academic institutions to work together in centers, institutes, virtual or real. Things that today are taken for granted. Another important consideration was my conviction that NSF could and needed to play a bigger role in science policy than it traditionally had done especially in what modern science requires, namely being the driving force in shared programs and shared infrastructure and facilities. Secondly, it was very clear that computers and IT would be more fundamental and access by researchers to the leading edge of computers and computing was a necessity. So was the use of computers, by the way, in the daily workings of NSF and its very talented workforce. By the way, computers and computing are examples of technology whose impact initially was completely underestimated. The story of Tom Watson pred predicting that six of the then existing supercomputers would satisfy the worldwide demand was, by the way, not as ridiculous than if he had predicted a computer in every home and on every student's desk, which certainly would have made him the laughing stock of the world. But that's where we are today. Uh, going back to NSF, a third observation was that new funding was needed. And NSF could not be satisfied to be the round-off era 
on the federal budget, as someone in OMB called it. By the way, with a trillion dollar budget or, or multi-trillion dollar budgets, being the round of error is not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> Out of these observations eventually came what has been mentioned before already, uh, the engineering research centers and science and technology centers. A reorganization that created size directorate from groups that were dispersed uh, between MPS, engineering, even the front office, and probably a few other places nobody ever knew. This also communicated, however, the message that NSF was serious about becoming a leader in IT and, and the computer revolution. The establishment of supercomputer centers that would provide researchers and educators access to the best and fastest computers and computing facilities underscored this point. A budget that was no longer only concerned with dispensing science by the yard, as some wit put it, but that provided access to a vastly broader range of research activities was kind of a necessity. One of the considerations was that in many of the new programs, government and academia would not be the only participants, but industry could also benefit and actively participate through joint staffing and joint funding. NSFNet certainly was a prime example <coughs> of this cooperation with NSF, Merit, IBM, and MCI joining in this in this endeavor. I need to mention that the influx of new people into NSF management, like Nam Su in engineering, Gordon Bell, Bill Wolf and Peter Freeman in size, and Dennis Jennings and Stephen Wolf in networking, was instrumental and necessary in putting NSF, if not on a new track, certainly on an extended and broader one. NSF was not, NSFNet was not created de novo. The foundation upon which it was built, as discussed in all morning long and probably tomorrow, was the use of packet switching technology in the ARPANET with the protocol invention of Bob Kahn, thanks a lot, and Vin Cerf and the NSF funding of CSSNet under Larry Landweber's leadership. Launching the Supercomputer Initiative in 1985 by funding centers in Cornell, Princeton, Illinois, Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh, and San Diego created the additional impetus to pursue a network that could link researchers in the U.S. with the computational resources they increasingly required. The establishment of the centers was in response, by the way, to the community consensus led by Ken Wilson that research access to state-of-the-art computational research capabilities was a need. But just establishing this cent these centers would not have been effective by themselves if a mechanism would not have been provided for connecting computer users to the facilities. In 1985, Dennis Jennings and Steve Wolf started the Division of Networking and Compu Communications Research with key decisions, namely to build a general purpose research network to connect regional networks as well as the supercomputer centers and to, to, uh, to firmly adapt a TCP IP protocol approach. As a consequence, in 1986, NSFNet began as a project of, of the Cornell Theory Center and, S, uh, and SDSC. In 1990, uh, the Advanced Network and Services Company, uh, as it was called at that time, probably still called that, with its roots in, in, roots in IBM, established to provide an NSFNet net, network service on the contract to merit. Uh, NSNFNet project 
got commercialized later on, as was related uh, before. And NSF I think, played a key role in the transformation through the acceptable use policy modification and the establishment of network access point. This is pretty much the history. It's interesting to hear what the chair of the Federal Reserve System, Alan Greenspan, has to say in his new book, The Age of Turbulence, about the development of the Internet. And let me quote from that. The explosion in Internet use helped turn what had started as a U.S. government-funded online sandbox for scientists and engineers into the digital thoroughfare of the world. And I think that's a pretty good statement and a pretty good description. I went to this length to describe the changes in NSF required in order to change the outlook in NSF, but equally important to change the image of NSF in the eyes of government, the academic community, and the public. In a celebration like this, it's proper to look backwards and celebrate accomplishments that changed the world as NSFNet certainly did. But I think it's also proper and maybe even required to look ahead, and as I said in the beginning, I would like to make some comments reflecting on the issues that we are facing today in science, technology, and education. And by the way, we are facing many. It reminds me of the 1980s, when Japan was poised to become the premier country in semiconductor research, in semiconductor production, and with it, obviously, in computers, especially supercomputers. Many critics point to that event in our history, comparing it to today and essentially asserting, if it did not happen then, today's concern about danger to our preeminence in science and technology is a false alarm. What these critics do not understand and in fact, maybe they are ignorant of, are the countermeasures that were put in place at that time to defeat the Japanese threat. Let me just mention a few. Joint industry action to bolster and accelerate research to found, by founding the Semiconductor Research Corporation, which after 30 years still exists and still funds research in universities paid for by the industry. A second action was a government action to enforce trade laws and trade barriers to the import of illegal products. A third one was federal research agencies that were funding jointly with industry, especially DOD and later NSF, and other measures. So the question is, what should keep us Away, awake at night today. First of all, new competitors. China and India, who is a former being the leading exporter today of high technology products. And India being a serious developer and supplier of software and technical services. The second thing is the rapid development of these countries leading to immediate consequences like offshoring of services and engineering design. There's a controversy there. Is that a problem or an economic benefit to the US? Is a question that's always being asked. My concern is that the buildup of efficient technical industrial clusters in these countries that have access to parts manufacturers and designers to diminish the advantages of our clusters, like Silicon Valley, Austin, in their capability and business volumes, and therefore cause them to become less competitive. The irony is that the internet is what makes this kind of an operation for, I for China and India more possible, and for remotely located resources to play an important and timely role 
in systems design and services like in medical analysis and others. Some data from the Council on Competitiveness uh, I want to share with you also. If you uh, look at the creation of new PhDs on a global output basis, uh, we had a 52% kind of, of, uh, of a level for many years. Today, in 15 years, by the way, it dropped to 22%. If it's the same point on scientific researchers, we are in 15 years our global output, measure this as, as on a global basis, our output is 41% or was 41%, today it's 29%. BS degrees, similar kind of a story. From 39%, we are down to 29%. And scientific publications, as you have seen just in the last few weeks, uh, have dropped from 38% as our share of the global output to 30% today. I think this data from the Council on Competitiveness should give us some concern. Couple this with the fact that our share of high technology export has fallen and our trade balance in high technology, not, not in, 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 in total, but in high technology manufactured products, has shifted from a surplus of $33 billion in 1990 to a negative $24 billion in 2004. The gap between US and the developed nations in high school attainment is not narrowing, and an insufficient number of US students are pursuing careers in science and technologies. Some of these problems are not new, especially the last one I mentioned. But the point is, we have not made the necessary corrections. So the question is, what actions must be taken? And there have been a number of proposals made from various private and public organizations, and let me speak to this point. The National Research Council report, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, recommended an increased budget for NSF, resulting in the American Competitiveness Initiative legislation that set NSF and two other agencies on a path to double their basic research budget in 10 years, and many other actions. By the way, uh, this was not an appropriation committee action, and therein lies the problem, obviously. Other actions that, were, that the um, gathering storm report uh, suggested is to recruit 10,000 science and mathematics teachers annually and strengthen the skills of existing teachers. Increase the federal investment in long-term basic research by 10% over the next seven years. Allocate 8% of the federal research budgets to fund unconventional ideas which could become part of the US research agenda. And finally, institute 25,000 new four-year undergraduate fellowships for US citizens in science, engineering, and mathematics. A second report worth mentioning is the PCAST report on federal IT and networking leadership on the challenge, information technology R&D in a competitive world, is the lengthy title of that report. With a $3 billion budget to give the priorities to high-end computing, cybersecurity, and information assurance, to research into human-computer interaction, and increase the collaborative research programs in IT and the social sciences. The Council on Competitiveness, which has worked closely with the National Research Council in its strive to keep the US the economic leader, calls for a national environment that supports innovation in all its forms and that anticipates new dynamics that create competitive advantages. 
To all of this, I want to add greater collaboration, both nationally and internationally, is probably a challenge that we all face. I want to leave you with two thoughts. The first one is, if you are still active in research, remember that no matter what great changes have occurred so far, there are many, many more to come. And to continue pushing the boundaries with new and innovative developments is one of our tasks. An example of this are current efforts of NSF to encourage new and transformational thinking about future networks. A second one is for all of you to remember that the issues I outline above and the efforts such as those outlined in the report rising above the gathering storm will not be addressed operationally just because they are important and they are good ideas. It takes the effort of every one of us and all of us as individuals or as members of professional societies to promote understanding and action by our national leaders. A great statesman and historian, Winston Churchill, said about the American people, and a statement that equally applies, by the way, also to To thank you for all you have done in, in the past, but also for all you will do in the future. So, so to enhance information technology, computers, science in general, engineering in general, that is so vital for the country's competitiveness. Thank you. Well, since Eric didn't take the full two hours he'd set aside for himself, I figure I have time to make a few remarks. <laughs> I encouraged Eric when I was talking to him about what he had to say tonight to uh, talk to us a little bit about the role he played um, at the National Science Foundation as this whole effort was being launched. Some of you heard earlier today uh, how important Eric was to the work that we've all done. And I've heard from many of you and your colleagues over the last few years, uh, uh, one anecdote after another, about how Eric's vision, insistence on performance, and understanding that focus for the foundation is absolutely vital played such an important role in a pivotal period in the United States and science in the United States. And I'd just like to tell all of you that in my opinion, we owe much of what we're celebrating here today to Eric Block. Thank you, Eric. Um, somebody just commented here, funny accents. Well, let me tell you, I like being in the United States of America. It's one of the few places where I'm the only guy who doesn't have an accent. Uh, we are apparently being watched around the world. And I have a note from Brian Carpenter sending me my best wishes. Brian is, is his best wishes. Uh, Brian is now in Australia. Um, and he just wants to reinforce the, the point, as Brian Carpenter always would, because he came from CERN, that CERN was a key part of all this. Yes, Brian, CERN was a key part of all this. We recognize that. <laughs> Greetings. Um, my, my role, the, the way we're going to do this is rather than me tell funny stories and try and entertain you, is we're going to ask a few selected people uh, to stand up and reminisce briefly 
about their experiences over the last um, 20 years of the NSFNet high-speed backbone, and if I may remind you, 22 years of the NSFNet program. If I just, just making a point here. The, f the first person I'm gonna call is Dan Van Bellingham. So maybe the microphone could, Dan, could, where are you? If you I don't know where you are, if you could stand up. No, you can stay where you are, stay with, stay with your glass of wine, there's no need to uh, come up here. But a microphone is on its way. But before Dan takes the microphone, just uh, let me say a couple of things. Uh, Dan um, and, and, and Irene Lombardo, who I understand we heard is, is ill, were the two key people who actually made uh, the sort of things we wanted to do happen. Dan was a program manager in the Office of, of Advanced Scientific Computing. He worked initially on the supercomputing centers in 1984, and then on NSFNet program in 1985 with me, and was an absolutely key resource and a very generous individual as well, which I'll talk about in a moment. Later in the Division of Advanced Networking Infrastructure and Research, ANIR, from 1986 to 1994, he worked on the Connections Program, which supported more than 1,500 colleges, universities, and other organizations connect to the internet. From 98 to 2003, he worked with EPSCoR, especially in relation to the National Alliance for Supercomputing Applications. Before that, he worked with SURA, the Southeastern Universities Research Association, on library and networking projects. Dan is now retired, and typical of Dan, working with several volunteer organizations, which is the nature of the man. He was extremely helpful to me when I arrived in the National Science Foundation. And Dan, your memories and anecdotes about NSFNet. Okay, Dennis, I have, uh, I have two anecdotes. I cut them down from three. People said keep it short. But uh, the early NSFNet was uh, our, our precursor to NSFNet. Uh, could have been uh, chronicled in Samuel Huntington's Clash of the Civilizations. Um, we were called together in early 1985 to go to a conference in, at SRI in uh, Palo Alto, and uh, Frank Quo was hosting it. And I kept hearing all these religious, uh, this is about the civilization, we kept hearing a lot of uh, uh, religious uh, terms. Uh, somebody was uh, uh, orthodox, somebody was uh, an apostate, uh, somebody who was a true believer. And I kept wondering, this is all new to me, I didn't know much about networking. <laughs> and uh, so we all met at the uh, Mermaid Inn out there on Camino Real and uh, we made our way over to the uh, SRI, their medium-sized auditorium and Frank Quo was our host. And I noticed uh, people were getting angrier and angrier about the way people were phrasing things. You're say, saying science net this and uh, supercomputing network that and let's have another study. And I, I turned away a second and all of a sudden somebody were throwing punches right there at, at the podium. There was uh, Frank Quo and somebody else, uh, I won't say, but uh, I know Dennis and uh, Larry Landweber had to pull them apart. And I said, oh, I'd be, I better be careful what I say if I go out and talk about NSFNet or about TCP with anybody. So from then on, I learned, I said, well, as Dave Mills would say, and then from then on, you know, I, I, I knew I had the right religion, okay. So. The other one was after we got uh, NSFNet going, and um, it was 1986, and we wrote our first program announcement to get people to, uh, to send us a, a, a proposal to get a connection to NSFNet. And uh, we, we, as I think Dennis pointed out this morning, we only allowed one of these connections to a university. Well, I got a call from several engineering schools. What do you mean? I have to share the internet with the business school? 
oh, it's going to go to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> and you know, maybe they were right. Thank you, Dennis. In the interest of moving things along, and um, while you continue to enjoy your meal, um, I'd like to call now on Peter Denning. I don't know, Peter, where you are, and maybe you could stand up so the microphone can get to you. Peter? You're over here, right. Let me just introduce Peter. Peter is a distinguished computer science professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, where he's leading a charge to set down the great principles of computing. In the 90s, he was at George Mason University, where he was Vice Provost, Associate Dean, and Computer Science Department Chair. In the 1980s, he was the Founding Director of REEX at NASA Ames. He was also a co-founder of CSNet, and therefore a very important person in our story of the development of the Internet. He was President of the ACM in 1980 to 82, and later he was the project leader for the ACM Digital Library Project. And as a computer scientist, and I didn't know this, but he has helped establish virtual memory as a permanent part of operating systems and is widely recognized as an outstanding teacher, writer, and researcher. Peter, your thoughts on the NSFNet? Thank you. Well, I want, I want to comment uh, about a lesson that I started to learn uh, while we worked on CSNet. We, this was one of the first community networking projects out of the gate. It was certainly the first one that NSF backed. And we had, we had a tough time of a lot of things. One of the things that stuck in my mind was at every turn, there seemed to be resistance. So when we wrote the first proposals, there was a lot of resistance from the reviewers. We wrote a second proposal, there was more resistance from more reviewers. As we tried to answer NSF's questions so we could improve the proposal and take away the concerns, there was more resistance to the answers. And then once we finally satisfied all of that resistance, then we found ourselves resisting each other inside the team. So this, of course, surprised me because networking seemed to be such a great idea. How can anybody resist this? So this, this actually planted a seed in my mind that turned, that's turned into a research project over the years about how does innovation actually work. And one of the things we've learned as a hallmark of innovation is that whatever community you're trying to get to change always resists. Resistance is completely normal in the process of innovation. It took us a long time to realize that. But this also, the people who've been studying innovation in recent years have come to a conclusion that there's a strategy that successful innovators have used over the years, even without realizing it, that enables them to overcome the resistance. We call this strategy disguise. <laughs> now what it means is like, you know, the moth that has spots on the wings and when it lands on the bush you can't see it anymore or the salamander that changes color, or the bird whose feathers match the, the shadows. That's the form of disguise. You, you take whatever you're working on, you make it look like the part of the normal background, and it, people don't pay attention to it, and then by the time they notice it, it's got too much momentum behind it, and they can't resist it anymore, or it overcomes them. Now it turns out that in the CSNet project, we in a, unwittingly use this strategy. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here to tell you about it tonight. <laughs> there was a lot of debate going on at the time as to whether or not TCP IP was going to survive or even become a, a noted protocol. It was widely believed that X.25 was going to move in from Europe and take over the United States. So if we said we fully embrace the TCP IP, we meet the resistance from the X25 people, and if we embrace X25, we, we meet the resistance from the TCP people. So our, dis our disguise strategy was we had a task, which 
I was in charge of at Purdue at the time, but our task was to, to build software that did IP over X.25. So we had both of them. And if, you know, if it turned out that TCP won, we were ready to go because all the protocols depended on TCP. And if for some reason it went X.25, we were right there. So that was one point of resistance, and that was our disguise strategy. The other point of resistance was around costs. Everybody was concerned about costs. Like, all right, so if we're going to do networking, we have new costs to put up with. We disguised that by pretending there weren't any costs. <laughs> so we told, we told all the uh, universities that joined CSNet that it would only cost them $500, and surely they could, that's you know, not even the price of an employment ad is $500, so they, they paid up. And then we told uh, the companies like IBM and Hewlett Packard that joining CSNet as an industrial member was exactly the same thing as they do when they join a department as an industrial affiliate, except that you get access to a much wider group this way. So we, we asked them to pay up the, the normal fee for industrial affiliates, which was 25000 So we disguised ourselves as an industrial affiliates program for, for industry and as a one ad service for universities. And they bought in and, well, I could go on like this, but I, I leave, leave that thought with you that, that resistance is normal and disguise is the way to deal with it. Well, Machiavelli, of course, had it uh, down pat. There is nothing uh, as difficult as change. You have the enmity of everybody who would be, uh, suffer from the change, and only the lukewarm support of those who might benefit. Another strategy, of course, for effecting change is to uh, bring in a foreigner with a gift of the gab, gab and, and, and tell people, God, he's only an innocent little Irishman. Would you believe that fellow? <laughs> I'd like now to call on Kathy Aronson. Kathy, there you go. Now, Kathy was one of the first wave of network operations staff hired in 98, in 88, I beg your pardon, to work on the Merit NSF Net Network Operations Center. Uh, subsequently, in 1989, she went for, to work for Hans Werner Braun, who unfortunately is not here, but a terrific guy, building KickNet. Uh, she left Merit in mid-1990 to move uh, to California, where she worked on, uh, at Lawrence Livermore, at Barnet, which was, which was our first T1 regional network, at Home Network, and at other internet companies. Kathy uh, now lives in Jackson, uh, W-Y. That's Wyoming. Wyoming, thank you. <laughs> you see, you bring a foreigner here, they don't even know what W-Y stands for. <laughs> it's the home of Dick Cheney. How about Dick Cheney, madam? <laughs> Where she runs, owns and runs, I think, a digital printing business, but she's still involved in the internet. She has recently been re-elected to the American Registry for Internet Numbers, Aaron, Advisory Council. A very important person, then, in the continuing development of the internet. Kathy, your thoughts on NSFNet? Hi, everybody. Um, I actually wrote notes, which is pretty scary. Um, I just feel like the knock is, is wholly underrepresented here, so this is my chance to say a few things. <laughs> and at the end, I'm going to need some audience participation, so be ready. So I got hired in the sometime in the summer of 1988 to work in the Merit Knock, and, and I quote you that I was hired because I was enthusiastic and because I had once debugged a computerized cash register. <laughs> we really, um, there were a bunch of us. We had limited skills. <clears throat> it 
We had a two-week crash course on um, networking. I learned from Dave Katz all about token ring, token bus, a lot of things that didn't prepare us for what we needed to know in the NOC. <laughs> um, we, we started, we had to answer questions during the, I worked all the shifts because I made a deal with the devil, I mean Dale. So our, the way our nursing schedule worked is that, because we had this weird nursing schedule, is that they needed somebody to do all the shifts when somebody was on vacation or whatever. So I was that person. So I worked all the shifts. So, you know, it depended on the, the day. So the interesting things always happened at night. But during the day, we got to find which modem was ringing open. Or we got to deal with the test network, or we got to deal with the NSF net, or we got to deal with MishNet, or we got to answer somebody in the dorm room who couldn't get their network to work. So it was a, it was a challenge. <clears throat> My favorites, though, were that we had nothing but ping. Um, we had a little bit of SNMP. We had this wonderful tool called XGMON um, that was sort of SNMP, and it was kind of homebrewed, and it was pretty cool, but most of the operators were red, green, colorblind, and so you really couldn't tell what anything was doing. <laughs> we had one really great network management tool that I'd been reminded was called Rover that actually was useful, and it was text-oriented, and it would tell you what was down, which was all you really wanted to know, right? What's down? You don't care if it's up. Who cares if it's up? So, but Rover wasn't very interesting because it was just lines of text. So whenever we had a tour, somebody would have to stand in the back of the room holding a slide projector that showed a picture of the network <laughs> <laughs> on the screen because no one who saw a tour actually wanted to see like lines of text. At night we learned that it was the only job I ever had where you worked by yourself part of the time and you could actually lock yourself out while going to the, leaving to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> there was a security man who would rove through the building in a random pattern because, you know, we might be doing something bad, and so you'd be there in the middle of the night all alone, and then the lights would turn on, like in some random place. So um, I started early um, harassing Hans Werner because it was kind of my life. So we had the test network. One day, the test network would be the most important thing on the planet. Like, oh my god, it's down. You have to fix it. And then the next day, you'd be like, oh, it's down. I better page somebody. Well, it's the test network. <laughs> Who cares? So I made a sign that sat on the top of the terminal. And you could flip it. It said, worry, it's a test network. Don't worry, it's a test network. <laughs> <laughs> and you could flip it depending on the day. So then we got the 24-hour analog clocks. Now think about that, okay? It's not noon, it's 24. <laughs> okay, so you're looking at the arms of the clock, trying to figure out what time it is, but there are 24 hours on that clock. So um, somebody who's here, who I won't mention, actually called Hans Werner in the middle of the night to ask him what time it was. <laughs> And then at night, on, on the night shift, we had, I think the most interesting outage was when um, we had someone in the bayou shooting with a gun at the fiber optic cable to Susquehannock. <laughs> and you know, you've been up so long, you don't really think too much about it. You think, oh, okay, a gunshot blast, great. So I sent out a note, and, and thanks to Dave Mills, it became the GOB factor, how many good old boys it takes to partition your network. <laughs> Anyway, um, so I want to end this with, um, I was in a room one day with Elise and some other people and I told a joke, which is an incredibly stupid joke, but I'm going to ask you a question, you need to say no, okay? And then I'll tell you why it's funny, because it's not funny at all. <laughs> <laughs> but since Hans Werner isn't here, I feel the need. So. <laughs> How many, uh, did you hear about the computer programmer who killed himself in the shower by reading the shampoo label? No. It said, lather, rinse, repeat. <laughs> so I told this joke in a room of people, and Elise was taking a Pascal class, and so she was laughing hysterically, because apparently she's really fond of the infinite loop. <laughs> Some other people tipped their heads, they were a little confused, and then Hans Werner said, and I'll never forget it, he said, why, he'd run out of shampoo, and he left the room. <laughs> Anyway, I'd like everyone to raise their glasses for the knock because, you know, we were the road crew and we were there all night. And to the knock. <laughs> Kathy, thank you. Thank you very
Yes. <laughs> John Connolly just told me it, yeah, it took him a while, but he got it. Okay. <laughs> He also, John, you said, um, uh, you said uh, something about a rut. Uh, oh, yeah, no, no, no. You, you were talking about people resistant to change. Now, you used to have a boss that would say, uh, um, uh, change bad, rut good. <laughs> uh, which reminds me, um, are, are you all familiar with the pick your rut with care um, story? You should be, because it's, it's a story of the, of the uh, new frontier in the United States. Uh, in the winter, the mud in the plains used freeze. And these were the ruts in the mud were ankle deep. So if you picked your rut, you went wherever that rut went. So you picked your rut with care. Why does it take an Irishman to tell you this stuff? <laughs> okay, because I love trivia. <laughs>